It is September the 21st, 2024. I'm Chris and this is the future of photography. The future of photography. And we're back with a, what, what do we call it? A crisp, new, bright, funny, interesting episode <laughs> that has, that has weird glitches in the audio. How about Man, that? Put the, put the pressure on, mate. Why don't you? <laughs> 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 oh come and on despite, come on wait despite wait. appearances I am despite not appearances <laughs> yeah love your glasses you look very Stanley. very special very rich <laughs> yeah, they're really like twenty dollars sunglasses they're oh, sure. rich. <laughs> maybe that's sure. the so cool for the day so um num, 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 num. last episode we talked about uh briefly talked about aspect ratios at the end of the episode the um, what's it called? The, the app again, Adrian, you used it for a while. I, I've been using it literally all week. So this is a really great conversation for me. Uh, it's called XPan, except the A is a four. Um, so, uh, and, 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 and it just, it just simply, simply crops and, and filters an image, right? No, it doesn't. No, the power of it is not that the power of it is in the composition because it shows you that wide aspect ratio as you compose. And for me, right, so I'm not going to give away the whole podcast in the opening gambit, right? But for me, that's a real <laughs> power change, right? And, I, and I've been loving it. But Yep. Yep, it does, yeah. does something to, to work in a different aspect ratio. And that is what we're talking about, aspect ratios. Um, and... Uh, most people know that there are at least like two different aspect r ratios, maybe three by four, um, 16 by nine for video and uh, maybe a couple more. A uh, question to, to the two of you, what's your favorite aspect ratio and why? Adrian. Uh, I, right. Well, this week it is uh, whatever it is that that app does. I think it's 65 by 24, isn't it? Because it's supposed to, or, or roughly 2.7 to one, because it's supposed to emulate a uh, Hasselblad X-Pan camera, which I believe uh, 65 by 24 millimeters was the size of the negative that camera shot. So this week, very much definitely that. I do like uh, a wide aspect ratio. I al always have done. Um, I would typically use uh, a 2.35 if I'm going for a wide, yeah, when I when I'm doing my editing and things like that, so sometimes a two to one, but but usually a two point three five if I'm going for widescreen. And according to our show notes, that is officially called Cinemascope. So there you go. So I'm it's a Cinemascope really, yeah, guy. Yeah, it's actually Cinemascope is a brand, but it's anamorphic yes. is the classic and it's lenses. it's, it's what what Cinemascope uses. Yeah. Ah, yeah. okay. An anamorphic okay. is the is the lens yes. type. Which stretches and compresses. I've always uh, wanted. Then, I've always so, wanted an anamorphic lens, but never bought one yet. So maybe, maybe today. <laughs> so, I, so yours, yours right now is the is the X-Pan um, ratio, which is fairly wide. Um, it's pretty wide. Yeah, yeah. And how about you, Jeremiah? Uh, not you know that that wouldn't be a good question for me because that's like asking me what my favorite color is they you know there we um, go having having I was worked, that's exactly the answer I was expecting from you you know uh, having shot film in aspect ratios of anamorphic done several in anamorphic which i absolutely adore in cinema People then come into the cinema, they sit in a seat and they experience it wide and your peripheral vision is basically transformed and you can you can really kind of take in the imagery um, very, very wide. So it, it, it is more encompassing. Um, though anamorphic on a cell phone, which you are holding in your hand uh, vertically, uh, just diminishes <laughs> the experience of it. So it's not something, I mean, I, I like the compositional element certainly, but, but I, I think it really depends on A, the subject, B, what you are intending to express, uh, and C, um, the output of that. Is it a screen? Is it a computer screen, which is typically wide? Is it a phone screen, which is typically held uh, vertically right. and in and, and and that really determines a lot of one's aspect ratio. If one didn't really care about that, 
um, one couldn't really take a picture without really having a, a sense of, of, well, where am I going to see this picture? How am I going to experience it? Is it in print? Is it on screen? Is it on my phone? Et cetera, et cetera. And, and so that will determine if I had to choose one, I would probably choose the most difficult, which is the square. I'm, I'm laughing. I'm laughing so much right now because um, before we started recording, I talked with Monica and I, I told her I would ask you guys this question. And uh, I also um, predicted that Jeremiah would have a very long answer for this, which is <laughs> it's completely along my prediction. So, and, and this, of course, is of course not fair to ask this to you, Jeremiah, because um, you deal with both stills and movies, and they have t very typical um, aspect ratios, and they change over the years, and. Um, it's it's almost like fashion fashion changes over the years and there's movie directors who play with that um like there's some movies that have multiple different aspect ratios throughout the sure, movie sure i've i've done it myself uh, 133 yeah. uh, which is near square i've shot and i love that when you watch old films yes. from the 30s in the 133 and even up to the 60s a lot of films uh certainly were done that way television was typically done yeah one three three. When I used to do which is which is four by three. One three three to one is four by four, three. Is right. four by three. I remember when I did commercials. This was a very big argument that uh, we would have with our clients and with the studios. Um, they we always wanted to shoot sixty nine when sixty nine came into um, kind of standard. 16 by 9, which is now kind of the default for HD video, uh, yeah, right? Yeah, and, and that was a big argument, too, because most of the cinematographers who were involved in creating the standards with the manufacturers wanted it to be closer to 235, uh, much wider. Um, they felt that the kind of 2 to 1 balance close was, was just a little um, limiting in, in terms of framing. Uh, but anyway, as 69 became very um, accepted uh, cinematically um, on, you know, on television anyway, um, our clients would go, we would want to come in and shoot everything in that compositional aspect ratio. But our clients were like, no, no, you know, you've got to cover for four by three or, or you know, one, three, three. And so you would... <laughs> You would have a uh, a shot that you would have to center punch everything. Uh, so you would have a crappy original aspect ratio and a crappy wide ratio. And this was this went on for several years <laughs> until we finally convinced everybody to abandon it because our usual thing is like, well, we don't care what people are watching our commercials on a black and white TV in Bulgaria. No offense to Bulgaria, but I think they were slow on the uptake Which, of Jeremiah, was that particularly TV. Was that particularly a, an American issue, right? Because I recall when in Europe, we transitioned from 133 to 16 by night, right? We all bought widescreen TVs. I remember then doing things like business trips to, to the US like five, six years later, and everybody still had old fashioned TVs. And I remember going, I go, like, you guys are crazy, you're way behind the time. So, so, so was <laughs> yeah, that I mean, I, peculiarly an American thing? I don't, you know, I, I can't say <clears throat> because the reactions that I was always battling were with the advertising clients who are trying to have right. it both ways. Um, certainly the, uh, I think until t TV prices came down, <coughs> um, <clears throat> there was a question of who was going to adopt the, you know, the wider screen. In Europe, it just could have been that the adoption case was faster um, because it wasn't as much of a TV focused uh, culture. I mean, that's possible in Europe, I'm talking about maybe. that. Yeah, yeah, Not in maybe. England, but in, in Europe. Um, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know, but it was, it was a battle. And finally, when we went wide, we were very, very happy um, with that. I, you know, I started my photography journey on a Rolleiflex. I think I've mentioned that before, which was square. So it, it was, you know, it's that comfort food. 
<laughs> visually. Um, the thing that I have noticed lately, though, and you'll because we haven't talked about AR and uh, AI in about five minutes um, lately. So, so uh, I have tried experimenting lately with shooting Square. Taking it into um, Photoshop, for example, and just going, oh, I think this would look good a little wider, and I would adjust the ratio and then generate the additional um, composition. And so far, maybe I've done it a dozen times, it's been impossible to tell that these were AI generated. I mean, it, it because I was not focusing on kind of adding a human or anything like that, just maybe ex expanding the, um, the environment, um, adding more ground, more sky, what, whatever it was, it was absolutely great. So I could actually narrow or I could widen. Um, I could go classic four by three, three by four, whatever it is. And that was a really fun experiment because I started with a square. That's that's really that's really fascinating I, that re reminds me of a couple couple of three years ago i, I did uh uh a, a, i'd call it more than an exercise i was i but it, it was it was a sort of a, a whim um, but i was um i, I deliberately was you, you, you're talking about they're about extrapolating right from a frame and, and and using generative ai to extrapolate i did one that was based upon interpolation so i it was the shot within the shot so I would shoot, uh, I think the camera I used at the time was a, uh, for, for this was a three by two sensor. You know, so uh, you know, th that was where I was natively. But I was extracting 16 by nine, nine by 16 square, you know, uh, all, all, all from inside that frame. And I, and I did them as a series of six by four prints. So I had yeah, the interpolation. So I had a set, you'd have like a half dozen, maybe, maybe four rather than six um you know six by four prints and you'd have the main one and you'd have all the, the the little different ones that i'd cut out of those in different aspect ratios printed on six by four so you could hold them in a and it was a really interesting exercise actually i, I really enjoyed it because it, it 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 sort of drew you into the photos and the images you know just just uh, uh that little bit more and, and being able to play with the aspect ratios you know cutting a, a nine by 16 out of a three by two is actually quite an interesting exercise see what you get I have a question for both of you. When you go out with a camera rather than your iPhone, um, is your instinct ever to turn it vertically, ever? Or do you yes. always have to go sort of re force yourself to do that? Because my tendency is always to go horizontal until I realize that now this is going to look better that way. I don't naturally put my camera up into a vertical position for me it's um i i made a i made a habit of getting that other orientation shot of something that i find interesting um and sometimes i start out with a uh, portrait format and sometimes i start out with landscape format but it really usually ends up both, oh. if I'm not 100 percent sure how this thing works, I and think sometimes I and sometimes I surprise myself um, in, in in post that I, when I go through the pictures, and I was, I'm like, I didn't think it will work, but it works much better the other or orientation. You know what's interesting? Um, now that I kind of thought of it, when I work with a large format camera, my instinct is generally to go vertically. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I think I think that's what I do, to be honest. Yeah. So I don't, anyway, I don't, I don't know why. <laughs> anyway, aspect ratios, wide field, literally wide field, um, and uh, the reason, of course, is um, if you've probably seen on the thumbnail of this picture that uh, we want to talk about Jeff Bridges, the dude, and uh, mm -hmm. he he was recently in a one of these late night shows and talking about a new movie and. He almost, almost like like it's not a big deal. Mentioned that and we know he's sh he's shooting the White Lux Japanese made panoramic camera with a rotating turret, and uh, it's been a classic. And they stopped making it, I don't know, twenty five years ago or something. And uh, 
uh, notoriously t uh, mechanically um, difficult. Let's put it that way. If, if you difficult have one, difficult to repair. <laughs> well, difficult to repair and difficult to make work smoothly. So um, anyway, he uses that camera. He has used it for many years. He's made books and websites and stuff behind the scenes on movie shoots and so on. And um, it's almost become a bit synonymous with him. This camera, if you if you look around and and look at like notable users, Stanley Kubrick loved it as well. Um, and he just mentioned in, on that late night show uh, that he's bringing it back, and that is interesting because yeah. um, he he has he has. Um, with his wife, I think, and a, and a magazine, it's the Silver Grain Classics magazine. I think there's a British photo magazine about black and I white photography. I think it's German, actually, or Austrian. Um, but okay, there's 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 Photo Classic, which is German, and they might be related in some way. I think I they think were they're related. Quite yeah. Mm. Anyway, Silver Grain Classics magazine and Jeff Jeff and Susan Bridges uh, together have formed a new company to produce a new White Lux and. Not just that, they're calling it White Lux with two X's, so they added an X. Um, <laughs> not really, no, because I did some I did some research, and uh, turns out that first of all they play planning to release it in 2025, so they're already working on it apparently. That's cool. Um, it is fully mechanical, and it seems to not just be a successor to the White Lux. It seems to be a White Lux, so they. Are planning to have, um, they're planning to have the the parts to be interchangeable with older White Lux models. They want to supply uh, people with spare parts, and so it, it looks like it is going to be a re a rebuilding of the original or one of the last latest models of White Lux. And do you have one? No, I don't. I always wanted one, but then. I was always a bit afraid to get a dud because you will find online, you, you'll find White Lux models on the different like platforms like eBay and that, and they, they come back into that platform weeks after someone bought them. So it... I, I have one. Do you use it? It's no longer it doesn't work anymore. That's the thing. They are they are notoriously. It's no longer a wide lux. It's a fit, yeah. uh, you know the lubrication. All of that stuff is very very specific. But I want to say that I used it probably for a decade, and I, I have all right. a lot of negatives um, that are in my um, files that are just beautiful, and and I, I did use it as my principal camera. But probably for a couple of years uh, in the early eighties. I'm, I'm really interested in if, if they if they are going to address some of the like mechanical weaknesses that the original have. Um, I hope they do. The camera will apparently be manufactured in Germany, so that's good. I'm not sure if that's a good sign or not, but well, <laughs> traditionally, pretty good, it's been pretty very, good cameras come out of Germany, Chris. I suspect yeah, that's probably a good sign. Yeah. yeah, but not for well. Okay, so the like still make. Uh, you know what? Just take the compliment. <laughs> okay, fine. <laughs> Well, you know, you know, but I've 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 looked into the history of photography, and when the Japanese came and took over, a lot of things went away, simply like that. Anyway, well, I don't. I must have missed that week in history in school. I didn't realize the Japanese had invaded Germany, but like, <laughs> well, camera-wise, they have. They've ah from from the German. No, they're the ones that ruined yeah. my my Hasselblad uh, Ekpan which I was go. a huge fan of and have have criticized it uh, at length on this uh, podcast. Anyway, the White Lux is coming back. What do you guys think about that? Any new I'd be very excited. 
<laughs> I, I, I've got uh, one of my favourite photos. Uh, it actually happens to be of my wedding, uh, which is on the wall just beside me, but not in camera. Uh, it was taken by a friend of mine on his wide lux. Um, uh, and, you know, it always seemed to me to be a, a, br a brilliant thing. So many times I almost bought, uh, there's a there's a Russian um, turret camera called Horizon, I think, which used to be on sale. Yeah. I don't know if you can still buy them. Um, and uh, so many times I almost bought one of those. I, I, by the time I really learned about the wide lux, it was its reputation and preceded it for being finicky. And it was also very expensive. And I thought, you know what, I'm not going to buy one because it's very expensive and it will break. Uh, um, of well, course, that a, was very expensive. It, how about by this? What about a challenge to make a digital wide lux? You throw two chips together with... Wouldn't that be fun? I think it'd be brilliant. Uh, yeah, uh, you could, or, or even if you just bought an off-the-shelf forty-four by fifty-five mil sensor, you know, the sort of thing they use in medium format sensors these days, and 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 built a turret <laughs> camera based it. around a sensor like that. It'd be a bit expensive, but I know it'd, it'd be good. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds fun. So, okay, so wide lux. Um, I, I think it 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 really fits into the whole thing of um let's say a bit of a of a uh analog camera make a revival looking at what is it the Rolai small Rolai 30 millimeter camera being manufactured again by mint camera we're looking at um, at least two or three other analog camera projects film camera projects um that are in the making and of course we're looking at The, the the whole instant photography thing being absolutely there and uh i i think it really it it feels a bit like a new trend is starting or there's a bit of a revival of of film photography hardware do you think that this is a reaction um generationally because uh, since we're talking about aspect ratios, the vertical aspect ratio is very generational. I mean, it really came out of the use of the iPhone and how we use it and how we hold it. And, 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 but experiencing uh, those things on a wider screen, um, you know, computer um, rather than print is something that just never really fuses together effectively, you know, but, Now that more people are just experiencing those images on iPads or whatnot, which which are closer to that aspect ratio, maybe there there is a kind of reaction to the vertical um, aspect ratio that's kind of feels newer. Well, as as I said earlier, the 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 as the whole aspect ratios thing, which is part of this camera, of course, is a, is also fashion. And if we look at fashion trends, they tend to come around again after some 20 years or something. So um, that might just be it, the whole, um, we have 2024 right in the middle of that decline of film photography and the whole, well, three years before the iPhone bringing in the vertical video, the vertical photography. So possibly we're looking at just one of these pendulum swings that, that are fashion-based, possibly. On the other hand, I, I usually have a knee-jerk reaction when I see someone uh, standing at a, quote, vista point of a massively effective and beautiful <laughs> landscape holding their phone that way. Uh, it, it's just like I want to run up and shake them, but I hold myself back. Well, yep, I, I, I feel you. I feel you. So, yeah, the Wide Lux coming uh, back. I, I, I don't know anything about the product other than, than they are apparently working on it. Wide Lux, Wide Lux uh, with two X's dot com, I think, is the, is the website where you can sign up for the newsletter. Um, no. Chris, this is a question for you since you just got your new iPhone with your function button. Will this and has this at all changed the aspect ratio of your photography on your iPhone when you pick it up? No. In other words, because you can 
obviously hold it with one hand and take a snap, right? So I yeah, the the new iPhone had um, that works. It works well enough, but of course, all the other older things that we were used to, like using the volume buttons to take photos, still works as well. So um, I haven't really started really using it that much i'm still um shooting the way i i'm used to so we'll probably take a while to switch over it, it does work and you can use the different but you can also use the screen to do it which is honestly a bit faster so it, it, it'll it'll take some time to really incorporate it and of course, I will not incorporate it if it makes things slower or less accessible for me. So, um, got to got to give it some time. I've only had it for a few days now, so need to give it some time. It's worth All coming right. back to that one, I think, because it's uh, yeah, as 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 you as you dig into it, because it's a, it's an interesting. I hadn't thought about the uh, the the natural tendency for a uh, uh, shooting landscape or portrait. That is an interesting one. Mm. Um, and it, it lends itself to both the way it's placed on the on the phone. It's it can be your camera button in a horizontal fashion as well as your thumb is almost naturally on it if you shoot vertical. So, yeah, it does certainly does the trick. But I it it wasn't initially wasn't the rev it to be, but on the other hand, if someone hasn't had that before. Um, it makes the phone feel a bit more like a proper camera because it's a it's a dedicated photo related um, button and we haven't had that before. So presumably only if you've never ever seen a real dedicated camera before. <laughs> well, but then but then you know the button is is in the same place where a dedicated camera has its button. Um, so yeah. Oh, it, it, okay. It, it, Fair point. Uh, Chris. Why don't you send me some spatial visuals and oh, yeah. I'll look at them on my vision That's Pro. a good idea. I can certainly do that. Absolutely. Because, yes, the phone can now shoot spatial photos and video. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Will do. I, I can experience them in real time. I won't even tell you. Just <laughs> take your I'll best shot. <laughs> do my plays. All right. How about some pics? Sure. Um, I brought you one that is no. Actually, I'll I'll wait with mine to the end because I find it it's a bit outside of what we're talking about, but interesting nevertheless. Um, let's go to Adrian. How about Gerda Taro? Yeah. So so I this is this is part confession actually for me this week because I am gobsmacked. I've never heard this story before. Oh. Um, okay. Uh, so, so uh, Good Taro was uh, a war photographer. Um, recognised, as it said in the headline of that article on the Magnum Photos website, but possibly the first female photojournalist ever to be killed, you know, as a, as a result of being in combat. And um, what I didn't know um, was that uh, I didn't know about her and the role she played in the legend that is Robert Kappa, who was one of the co-founders of uh, the Magnum Agency. So she was his, I think it describes it as a companion uh, and professional partner. Um, and uh, they shot together. And and Robert Kappa, uh, obviously I knew that Robert Kappa was a, a name that had had been made up to avoid certain persecutions in, in the, of the time. But I hadn't realised that it was uh, both of them, um, her and uh, the man we now know as Robert Kappa, whose name momentarily escapes me, um, shooting together and a lot of her fo a lot of those early Robert Kappa photos were actually shot by Gerda Taro she later became known in her own right and and, very, and tragically died uh, while shooting uh, the the Spanish Civil War at the age of only 26 um, but it's uh, so so part of me this is confessional to the to, to the audience that I'm sorry I didn't know this part of photographic history um, but part of it is just a fascinating and tragic tale um, uh, but good to see that she gets the recognition that she she didn't get at the time. Yeah, I didn't know about her role in the whole Robert Kappa story until, I don't know, six, seven years ago. So it um, took a while for me to... And I had the exact same reaction. I was like, what? Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. I was like, yes. wow, I had no idea. Yeah. Yes, that's a, did I. Uh, that's that's a heck of a story, yes. Yeah. 
All right. And thank the, you for that. The, and the Lee Miller uh, movie is going to come out very soon, too. Oh, so yes. Good is, point. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good. Again, there's a trend. And uh, Jeremiah, you brought us, oh, yeah, educational content. The That's it. More aspect the, ratios. You know, uh, academic aspect ratio and analysis, which um, anybody who is interested in exploring how this all works and what one's tendency is for gear and composition and how these things have worked, uh, it's interesting. Because you just kind of go through it and, ah, oh, yes, oh, yes, that's great, you know. Um, find your little space in it. But, um, you know, choosing aspect ratios, I think, is um, very, very um, subjective and also determinative by the subject and by the output. I like it. I like it. That will, that will add all substance under what we talk about, right? Okay, so um, last but not least, I brought you a project that I just recently came across. Um, there's a photographer by the name Jonathan Keats, who is um, doing a project called Deep Time Photography. Has any of you heard of that? Nope. Deep Time Photography is an art and science project um, aiming to, it says here on the website, aiming to photograph years of environmental change in the... Sonoran Desert and beyond. He is building pinhole cameras that he's calling millennium cameras that will do or already doing 1,000 years of exposure. Oh, and uh, 1,000 years of, of, of continuous exposure or... One picture, 1,000 years of exposure. Okay, so wow. He's, he's added some, some like uh, na na natural pigments in there that will... Um, work in that context. These are copper cylinders, and the uh, pinhole is a is a gold foil. And um, uh, of course, we none of no, none of us will see these photos. Um, and it is, I think, more a, a it more provokes thoughts about okay, what does that even mean? What does time mean? How how are we gonna change it? Will these cameras even survive one thousand years, or will them in I don't know or will will they be lost in a volcano or something like that um, but the whole thing is very interesting if, if any of you has 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 any of you heard of the as slow as possible piece of music by John Cage I think I've heard, I think I've heard of it but I've not it's a composition it. that says as slow as possible and originally it was composed for and so he recomposed it for organ and there's an organ in Germany that plays this song and it's a 630 something years long song and uh, chord changes happen like I think the next the, 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 the recent one was just a few months ago and the next one is in 2026 so um, this, this is organ just constantly plays a, a, a chord people uh, come uh, visit from from all around the world to I to witness it. the chord change and they make it into mm -hmm. a ceremony and someone they don't press another key on the keyboard they switch out the pipes so it is th this project this photography project really f reminded me of that it's a uh, it's sure. it's uh, time and you, how we deal with it are you um aware of a project called the clock of the long now yes. Yes. Again, it's about, you know, a 10,000 year clock of which I think it clicks every hundred years as a second. And yeah. it, it needs to be wound and, and it, it encourages generational maintenance yeah. of the clock. And it's, uh, it's, it's a absolutely, these, these are very thought provoking exercises that really make us understand our personal, I want to call it insignificance, but not in a negative way, but just in the, in the manifestation of our yeah. existence over the billions and billions of years of so, what we call history. 
so making cameras that take a 1,000 year exposure is very small compared to the billions and billions of years, but photography is in time. So I think it's. I, I think it's thought provoking and great yes. just to think about it. Um, you know, my gut is after 300 more years, <laughs> there won't be humans anymore. <laughs> that's so that's the matter. But there may be another, um, you know, way to see these. I, I, you know, who knows? With another so maybe, maybe we should do a, a, a sister. Maybe we should do a sister project that is a, a time lapse over a thousand years. So you actually say, then we'll document the decline of the human species, Jeremiah. Then <laughs> I think I think a one thousand year pinhole photo is much less maintenance than that. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Indeed. Yeah. Anyway, I think we have reached the end of this episode. Um. Yeah, I've 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 uh, signed up for the newsletter on the whitelux.com website. Two X's. And De we'll definitely interesting. We'll just see where this goes. Again, not much yeah. there just yet, but they claim they want to bring this back in two thousand uh, in twenty twenty five. So I'm for it. One year from now, let's hope Good. they can do it. Heads and I would really be interested in what German manufacturer is behind it. Mm, yeah, anyway. Yeah. That was it. We are online, of course, um, on our Discord on thefuturephotography.com. And um, we'll see you soon. Until then, everyone, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. You've been listening to The Future of Photography. Subscribe to the show wherever you get your other podcasts. Find the show notes and more information at thefutureofphotography.com. Music